I'm just going to start up then. Um, so today we're discussing pullbacks and pushouts. Um, and pullbacks and pushouts are some of the most practical constructions in category theory in daily life, um, including for our frameworks. They come up when sticking models together and stratifying models, for example. Um, but um, also under the hood for certain types of kind of characterization of, of, of the, uh, the um, underlying dependencies and models. Um, there are also a sort of intuitive concept that likely you've encountered without knowing its name before. And, uh, but the firmer, further sort of elements of the, the celestial firmament uh, associated with universal constructions. And they are, they have really useful, but also very beautiful properties, like so much from category theory. So we're gonna be going through these today and, and we're gonna see that they have this very close relationship to, and in fact, serve as generalizations of products and co-products, okay? Um, uh, and this relax, relaxation, the rules over products and co-products uh, that will handle many uh, additional cases. Uh, and they capture some very intuitive relationships, um, not always in ways that are immediately obvious when you think element-wise, um, uh, but the underlying structure um, ends up being uh, yielding some properties that are that are kind of surprising. Eugenia Chang comments um, that these are more advanced universal properties, showing more general features that were missing from the special cases we've seen thus far. Now, I will say, if you've gotten this far in the book, chapter 19, you're you're to be congratulated. I know this is not easy. I know it forces you to really think. I know it takes time to read and sometimes one or two pages might require an hour of your thinking to follow diagrams. I, I know that's not easy. It doesn't come, um, it, it doesn't come, you know, trivially. But you have to understand you're also building strength with that. You're building tolerance and learning ways of thinking. Um, and, um, these these end up being not sort of merely curiosities or anomalies or or curios in the in the the categorical context. Like they're super useful. And once you start using them, you find them growing on you a lot. And um, while it's hard to come to grapple with these things the first time, it certainly eluded me for a long time exactly what a push out was, et cetera, how it operated. But once you come to understand that you develop this enormous intuition and then it just makes sense of so many related things and it helps helps you understand those related things as well. So if you're finding it hard, um, know that everyone goes through that and know moreover that it'll be worth it. Um, this, is, this is worth it. I recognize it's hard, it's hard for me, um, but I'm gonna try to give you some comments and some intuition which may ease a little bit things that trip me up over a long period, okay? Um, and we have Eugenia Chang to thank for her, you know, exceptional, exquisite treasure trove of Katzer's videos. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to watch her videos on pullbacks and pushouts, they're full of insight. They are, you know, timely and, and compact, and they are uh, to the point and uh, a lot of fun too. Um, uh, jolly good fun, as she would say. Um, and uh, I would I would recommend those to you. Uh, again, the Richard Southwell video. If you want to go deeper, if you want to understand some of the proofs, if you want to understand. Um, where these things fit in, it's 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 outstanding, and and I love it um, in its own right. But it's you know uh, in order, not quite an order of magnitude larger, but uh, several 
both binary or crucifying the two different triples. Um, now I'd like to you know, put these in context a little bit and talk about a recurrent issue that comes up with universal diagrams. We're, we're going to see or universal constructions. We're going to see that um, some universal constructions, per my comments from a few minutes ago, are exem exemplars of limits. Others are exemplars of co-limits. And um, that's going to be writ large over this um, because we'll recognize, oh, that's basically just uh, an elaborated, or as Eugenia Chang would say, souped up version of the process we go through for other types of you universal know, constructions. But one thing that's that's in common for a lot of constructions. I don't know. I don't know if I could say all. I, my knowledge is not deep, in, but I, I think it, it's for some that may not be co-limits or limits as well. Not, not, not positive. Um, I have to go back and look. But is um, when we have these universal constructs, we. We reason about morphisms. We, we're searching for the best, as Eugenia Chen said, exemplar. Of them. You know, the, um, the, the, the strongest um, of the, or the, the essence of, of this idea. And the idea that what distinguishes it is that all non-universal kind of pretenders or would-be versions of this, things that are otherwise alike it, are all subservient to or or um, uh, factored through the universal one. The idea is that all of all of the others um, that that have similar properties are not as good, um, and that's demonstrated by the fact that for all of them you can use the universal one. It factors through it. It's kind of like um, it's got the the universal one is the most basic properties, and everything else. Can just ride atop of it and 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 adds to it some inessential crust, some inessential uh, things on top of it. Um, the, the the universal construct is 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 kind of this one stop shop. And importantly, for for thinking about this factorization in ways that will hold for for limits and colonies, is it's kind of when we think about about this, the universal construct is. This kind of mediates. It's it's on the way. It's kind of every non-universal one um, uh, tags some extra stuff on this extra inessential crop atop what's provided by the universal. I said by Paul. It, it should really say by the by the universal construct more generally. Um, and the universal construct um, is kind of a factor of it. It. It's it's kind of like think about prime numbers, right? With prime numbers, um, they don't have any factors, right? Other than themselves and one, right? Um, this they're not composite of, of other other things making them up, other primes. But a non-prime number is made up of these multiplications of primes, right? Um, and uh, and it's it's it, it it can be boiled down to it can be shown to be sort of um, made up of these primes and it's like the non-universal one the non the would be contender that otherwise has the property you know many of the features of our universal one it, it it's like a like a non-prime number it's made up of the universal one. Like you can define it in terms of the universal one, pluck them stuff tagged on. And Eugenia Chang analogized it to like some stuff multiplied in there to sort of add, you know, put it in there. It's like a non-prime number could be characterized as being something in terms of primes. And and uh, and we're saying like primes are like um, the the atomic thing, the the essential thing, the the, the sort of one stop shop, the best, and and here the universal construct is is that one stop shop, giving us all this information and contenders, pretenders to be that they all ultimately can just depend on the universal one. So it's got the essence of the situation, the most the the best representation, and the others just hang on top of it, just like in it, 
a non-prime number hangs on top of the primes. And I, I draw very heavily in this, in this set of slides from the pictures in this, in this chapter. I, I produced uh, a lot of them myself, but those that I borrow, uh, uh, virtually all of them are from Eugenia Cheng's Joy of Abstraction. Uh, there's one from Richard Southwell's book, one or two, I think, from, from there too. Um, mm -hmm. he's, he has wonderful stuff. I, I will say that um, I realized late in the game, just before I started teaching my other class, that I had screwed up one of her conventions. I thought I'd been super careful about this, but I flipped A and B in some of the diagrams, like what's A and what's B. So I'll, I'll try, to, uh, try to flag that down. Um, but it just differs from hers, but it's my slides are consistent. I will try to fix it up later. So <clears throat> Eugenia Chang mentions, um, I think in the book, certainly in the videos, um, or exquisite videos, that uh, three of the universal properties that we've covered are limits, this thing called the limit. And that may seem mysterious, but as she discusses in the book, the idea is, we're reasoning about these limits over particular diagrams, okay? And, and the limits involve, does anyone remember what a limit, um, like what's what's a construct that all limits have in common? It begins with a C. Cone. A cone, right? They're, they're, they involve cones. And the universal cone is like the ultimate cone, um, right? Um, uh, so, Terminal objects, products, and pullbacks are all examples of limits over diagrams. Now, a cone, can you remember what, what a cone looks like? What does a cone look like? It's not like an ice cream cone where it comes up from. What does it look like? Yeah, yeah so there's an object at the top that we call the apex. Okay, that's the term that's often used, right? And then there are some morphisms down from it to the diagram over which we are taking the push up. So I've seen the pullback. The pullback. So if all we have is a diagram down here that has two, two objects in it with no morphisms, we get something that looks looks like this. It's a it's a cone here, um, and uh, is it apex? And has morphisms down to the uh, uh, to these to these objects. Um, and if we are, by contrast, having a diagram which has some morphisms in it, like that. What else do I need to add here? Uh, yeah, okay, well, okay, so that will be demonstrating any other good factor, but I need to add even something. This is the diagram down here. These are three objects in the in the diagram. And we'll be getting to what a diagram is in a in a later chapter. She'll be she'll be covering that for us. What what do I have to add also? Narrow that goes from here and, to anywhere. Yeah, narrow that goes from there to there. Um now, um, what we're going to see here is, is you know, these arrows go in different ways here, et cetera. Uh, but often we'll find that when, when, when we go to, to draw it out, I'm drawing it in full glory or using some ID morphisms, but, but ultimately one of these will end up being redundant because it's the, com the composite. But, the key thing is that we have we have commuting that needs to go on. So if you go down this way and this way, it's the same as that. If you go down this way and this way, it's the same as this way. And um, and often because this is given by this, we don't even we don't even try. Um, it's involved. Okay. Um, and as Tony said, we're going to have a universal property. And so if we have a diagram with just two objects be a cone on it and then we have this universal property shown over there on the right hand side where this is this is our universal cone right 
And this is a contender, a not so serious contender. Maybe it's, you know, Zippy the Conehead or something that that has a morphism uh, to the universal to the universal one. But it's not just any morphism; it's a what morphism? Unique morphism. Unique morphism. And moreover, there's a condition here that it's not only a unique morphism, but it makes what happen? Yeah, so it, it has to commute. So this morphism here after K must be the same as this one here. It's got to commute um, both ways. It, it's sort of canonical. It, it makes it really, really nice. And so we start with a diagram. We build a cone over it. And then we, re we reason about the best cone. And what I'm saying is that each of these ones here, terminal object products and pullbacks, they're all examples of this process. They only differ with what's in the diagram. So which one is shown here? Which one of those is, is, is the one that's, that's shown here? Do you recognize this? Product. Product. That's the, that's the product in there. Um, that's good. Uh, this one over on the right, this is the universal property of a product. Remember that? It had these projection morphisms down and any other would-be contender. Maybe this is the one with three things in it, but this is the product of these. It just has two. And the three, it could represent, you know, A and B, but it does so kind of wastefully with, with other other inessential product. Um, and, and as such, it can it can be factorized. It's kind of like a non-prime number that can be broken up into its prompts. It can be broken down. Does that make sense? So what I'm saying is this guy can be can be factorized. It's got these inessential parts. It's almost like it's a, as, as Eugenia Chen says, um, it's it's almost like it's it's like the the best one times some extra number and and it can just depend on the best one. So we know it doesn't capture the essence of it. It's got inessential craft. Is that okay? Okay. Um, now, so that's that's the diagram. And when we're dealing with the pullbacks, we're gonna be going through a similar process. Um, we're gonna have a diagram. Talk about that in just a moment. The diagram whose limit is being, we're going through the limit process. So I'm trying to set that up. That these are all how we build limits of diagrams. And all three of these are limits of diagrams. So this is the process of a diagram. In this case, it was a particularly simple diagram. All it had is two objects. We did that last time. But in general, you have a diagram which has morphisms in it. And you build a cone on it. And the cone is not just any old sort of morphisms coming down. It comes with these commuting conditions. It has to be of these nice properties. Um, and the limit is this universal cone that has this, it's the best cone. It's the most essential cone. The essence, the distilled essence of cone. Hmm? Um, Coneness. Um, and in the sense that anything else is built out of it, it can be built out of it. Anything else can be defined so that it, it just tags on some extra inessential property, but like that any and that that thing labeled any other column, this other x, any other thing can get to it. But remember, and I'm going to be in this type in this presentation, I'm I'm going to be I'm, I'm layering in, and, and I I apologize because you know to Eugenia Chang, I'm not even worthy to be a TA, much less you know be modifying things. But I will say that. I, I'm putting in some commuting marks with these checks just to remind us because, you know, uh, all of us are very early on the road of learning and it helps to remind us that a key part of when we're dealing with these, these cones over diagrams is to remember that they have to commute. So I'm just going to be layering these things in these check marks, which means that commute like this, this uh, for a cone, for it to be a, uh, an honest-to-goodness cone at all, um, 
it has to, you know, this triangle has to commute. This triangle um, has to commute uh, here. Uh, this triangle over here has to commute. Do you see that? And sometimes we'll have we'll have squares that that have to commute, for example. But um, often themselves are built out of, of triangles. So just remember, I didn't show it on the right, but this is filled with like commuting connections. Okay. Mm -hmm. That it, it, it it sort of this 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 cone that captures the essence of it. So. So when we have a pullback, this is the diagram over which we build the limit. It's not as simple as a product. What was it for product? What was the diagram over which we built the cone for product? What did, what did this diagram consist of? Remember? Just three minutes ago. Two objects. Any morphisms? No, only identities, right? For each of the objects. It was a discrete sort of thing. Each, each. Object was a solitude, no relationships. Here, are there relationships? You, you bet there are, from A to C and B to C, right? And we build a cone over it. And, and there you see the cone on the right. Mm -hmm. You see it? See that cone? And it comes with commuting conditions. So this, this cone held at B, um, you know, this. Uh, this morphism from B to A and then A to C, that has to commute with getting to it via the central strut, the central sort of morphism here. Do you see that? And going, you know, from down to B and then over to C has to also commute with this. It has to, it has to capture these, these commuting. Now this may sound weird, but it, it turns out that that's how you compute limits of diagrams and limits turn out to be just unbelievably valuable and, and useful constructs. Now, a key thing to realize when we see the diagram subsequently for pullbacks hmm, is that we don't draw the central strut, this guy here. Why don't we draw that? I uttered it earlier, why not? It's implied, it's implied. It, it's implied because the composite, oh, Composite of any two morphisms have to exist in the diagram, and therefore the composite, oh, okay, um, of this one B to A and A to C and to N have to compose from something to B to C. And a basic rule of being a category is any any two N to N morphisms have to compose. And so we know there's one from B to C, so we, we don't draw, it, just like we don't draw the yeah, any morphism because we know they're there. Does that make sense? So we're not going to draw that. Now, I'm going to go on to pullbacks, which are just the most interesting, fun structures and useful structures, and useful in our work, and useful in the work that you will do. Uh, but I want to I want to say that we shouldn't neglect a little bit of discussion about terminal objects, because you may be saying, okay, I, I kind of understand how how uh, products are an example of a limit. I kind of understand now how pullbacks are an example of the limit. How about terminal objects? What's what's their diagram? I mean, this looks pretty minimal with with a product. But for terminal objects, what's their diagram? Anyone? What do you think the diagram would be for a terminal? Object? It's small. It's small. Turns out. So its cone is a vacuous cone. Remember when we talk about a co-product, I'll sometimes say, you, you probably caught me saying it. And rightly so, you could have reacted with appropriate last time because I, I may have said like, oh, this, this, this essential one up there is the, is the product. That, that object is the product. Remember I said like, what's the product of it? True and false, and the answer was remember that what, what was the product of true and false, and we said the object you know that that false is the product, but technically it's not just the object; it's the object with the what? Um, nothing. Well, with the morphism down, 
So, so a product is actually technically not just the object, it's it's with the more the projection of the physics. Often we we know they're there. We don't talk about them a lot, but we say, you know, false is the product of true and false. Or remember, remember we did it for 10 and 15, and we said the product was in that divides by category. Remember that? 10 and 15, the product was what? Five. 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 And, and, and again, that's a manner of speaking. It's kind of a shorthand, but it's a bit sloppy. And really, it's five with the morphisms down to 10 and 15. But we were a bit sloppy. And, and so here, it's 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 for for products. It's it's the the apex, the object, and the universal one with the morphisms. With with uh, pullbacks, it'll be uh, the, the the object with the morphisms down, the the um, the projections, just like that. As we'll see, what is it? If if we have an empty diagram over which we're taking the limit. What do you think the terminal object is? It just is the what? Remember, th th there's nothing to connect to down here. It's just the object. It's just the object. It's a terminal object. And every other object has a unique morphism to it. Does this sound familiar? When we have a limit, the limit is distinguished by having every other cone over the same diagram have a unique morphism to it, right? To, to its apex, right? And what I'm seeing is the terminal object is, is just like that. It has a, it, its limit is, is particularly austere. It's particularly sort of minimalist. It's all it is is the object because there's nothing to connect to in the diagram. And every other would-be contender, every other pretender, every other every other thing that would like to be a terminal object has a unique morphism to it. In other words, every object in the category has a what? Unique morphism to it. Does that sound familiar for the terminal object? The terminal object is like a degenerate, <laughs> like minimalist cone. Do you see that? It's like a minimalist limit it doesn't have any morphism so it's just the object and any other would-be contender is factorized by it by having morphism to it it's and, and it's just no fuss no must there's no extra machine there's no extra like um morphisms down or anything does that make sense so with an empty diagram all we have is the limit is uh object <laughs> And the best one is the one that everything else uniquely links to, which is called the what? Terminal object. So that's a limit. It's it's like a ultra simple limit. So we have an empty diagram having the limit be a terminal object. We have a diagram with just two objects. The limit of it is a what? A product. That cone, that cone over there with these nice relationship. And for a pullback, we take the limit over this diagram. And we're going to see this diagram central. And we're going to see the cone over it, except we won't draw that central strut because it's implied. We'll just draw B to A and B to B. Are we ready to see it? Are you ready? See it. Okay. So, so here, here we go. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. A, B, C. M remember this thing? Just, just from there? So here's the diagram. And here's a, here's a cone for it. Do you see it up here? This cone. And it has to commute. Where's the middle strut? Where's the one from? Is there, one, is there a morphism from X to C? Yes, it is. It just isn't drawn because it's implied. Hmm? And there's commuting going on. This whole thing has to commute, and and kind of by extension, this this one on each side, but but that falls out. Okay, so so what do we see over there on the right? What what are we looking at there? Who can interpret this? So I, I tell you, B is the pullback of this diagram. B is the pullback 
of this diagram here. Do you recognize this diagram? A, B, C. It's just what we saw here, right? Um, and I'm telling you, whoa, B is the is the pullback of it. So what what is X here? And this right, this right one. Oh, oops, sorry. Sorry. Ah. Um, what is X here? Some other object that also has a column that makes a column over A and B. Yeah, yeah. X is a and beautiful. Exactly right. X is another object that that serves as a cone over that same diagram, A, B, and C. It's another tender to the limit, a contender. It would like to be the limit, but it's got an essential crop. And we know it as an essential crop because of what? Because it has, it's not the real McCoy. It's not the real one because it has a what? Factorization. It has a factorization. And it just tags extra stuff on, right? What's a unique factor? Beautiful. And, and it's not only another cone that is this unique, I mean, it's unique factorization that makes these triangles commute, right? It, it's got to make these, these triangles commute here. That's unique factorization. K has to be such that P after K is equal to what? So P after K is equal to F. Good. And, um, sorry? Um, so uh, F, uh, F doesn't necessarily equal G, um, but what is the case? What is the case for G? There is a commuting condition for G. Q after K, yeah, is G. Yeah, that's maybe what you were saying. Yeah, exactly. And this, this, um, nice. Nice thing down here, this um, square also commutes. What does it mean that I, that, that square commutes? We've been mostly talking about it for triangles. What does it mean that the square commutes? Can anyone tell me the condition for that? Um, P, P, uh, so P, sorry, say this again, Tony? Uh, uh, F after P. F after P. T after Q. Remember, um, we can test equalities for morphisms here because we're not dealing with another level up from that. And so it's viewed as kind of morally okay to, to, to test the equality for morphism. So F after P is equal to T after Q, right? Um, um, so that's the, that's, that's a key property for the product, right? That's going to be yeah. huge. Now, commonly we interpret P and Q as projections. Do you remember? Like we talk about them as projection organisms. Do, do you remember where we saw that last time? Or where do we have projection? Yeah, with products, right? Um, we have these projection morphisms down from it, right? Okay. Um, so the standard notation is as follows. And you'll notice that there's um I, I put in a check mark. Eugenia Chang doesn't. She, she mentions it, obviously, it's absolutely central. I put it in there just to remind us all the time, right? But here we have, where where is the pullback here? Where's where's the apex of the pullback? Where is it? What Which is the apex? Is it C? Is it A? Is it B? What is it? B. It's V. It's V out there. That's what it is. And that's the pullback. And we describe it in different ways. You could say uh, it's the pullback of A and B over C. Or we could say it's the pullback of T along S. As, as Eugenia says in the video, you pull it back, right, along S. Or it's the pullback of S along T. That's what Q is, or, or P is pullback of T along S, I should say. Um, and we'll be using that, but you'll notice that we highlight where the pullback is with this, with this right angle. Do you see that? Okay. Um, and by the way, this is where I, I've got to highlight. I, I screwed up because she has A down here as the target of P, and I have A on the upper right as the target of Q. Sorry. Um, sorry, I, I have sent. So I, I, I've got to fix that. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it will cause any, any serious confusions here, but I will, will work. I just didn't have time. And I, I didn't want to risk doing a half job. And, Give you some okay, so 
So I need to I need to tell you some cool things that will be really really relevant. So one thing is pullbacks preserve monomorphisms. I don't think she talks about that. I don't think Eugenia Chang in this in this um, uh, chapter talks, but maybe she did, and I I you know missed it because and so I do so many things because I'm, um, I'm I'm building up here as well in my knowledge. So so the idea is. We, we denote monomorphisms in several ways. And you'll see in the different videos that I recommended, like Richard Southwell, he shows a monomorphism like this. It's one of these sort of um, back hook there, sort of, oh, sorry, um, sort of, uh, I don't know if they use for other fork arrows like that. But another common way to write monomorphisms that John Weiss are, are uh, you know, co lead on the, on the, on the Algebraic um, Julia stuff, um, you know, huge guide there is um, writes it with a hook there. So I've used the hook there. Okay. So those are, do you remember monomorphism? Remember the idea of that? Remember we saw that earlier? Things are monic. Um, do you remember what monomorphisms correspond to in, in set? They're what sort of functions? Monomorphism corresponds to what sort of functions? It's functions that are, begins with I, yeah. and Jeff. And we have an injective function. Um, and, and often this, this is how we think about it more generally with monomorphisms. Um, injective function is one that what what is an injective it being injective means? Can you remember? How do we know if it's not injective if it does what? It sends two elements to the same place. Two yeah, two, two, elements, two elements. Two elements are mapped to the same one. That wouldn't be injective, right? It's like forgotten which one it came from. It it it, it loses the information about its source, right? Because it goes to it, it can't know which one it means. But if it's injective, it, it has this nice property of kind of being mapped in ways that don't lead to clashes, right? Do um, you remember this? Remember this? For an injective function. And really, we think of, when we go heads here, um, when we see this, we think of this as kind of saying that this is embedded in this. It's almost like we're saying this is the subset of this because it can go into it. And, and it's not all of it, maybe. It would have to be epic if it were all of it, in which case we have bijection. But it's like a subset of it. It's defining it as kind of a subset, right? And when we see a monomorphism, we often think of it as like saying A is a sub-object of C. It's not always, it's not always a set mapping, but it's like sub-piece of C in some, in some sense, in some structure preserving sense. It's a sub-piece of C. Maybe it's a subgroup. Maybe it's some sort of sub-monoid, or maybe it's some sort of sub-preorder that has extra structure beyond what sets have. But it's like it's like a piece of A. A, piece, a is a piece of C. And here, I'm, I'm talking the left here. And V is a piece of B. It's within B. It's like, does that make sense? And, and often these intuitions end up being super useful. It's like um, A is a, is a sub-object of B. It's like it yeah, has, has a piece of, of what C has. But not all the time. Uh, by, by, by that, can I say uh, maybe also um, have a monomorphism? No, I don't even see. Um, C, so it may not be monic all the way to C because F could collapse there, right? Mm -hmm. S could, like, there's F on the way to C through, through <laughs> the lower part, or Q could, right? Now we'll see. That will be dealing with beautiful, beautiful pullbacks that where both of these are monic. And then it's like awesome. Then 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 it's like it's a, it's got a monomorphism to see all straight away. Okay. We'll see a beautiful case of that. 
In fact, Eugenia Chang, 15 years ago, it was her favorite square, favorite pullback, at least in the set. And even now in this book, it's still a favorite. Um, so, so we'll see, we'll see that. Okay. Um, so, so the idea is that pullbacks preserve monomorphics. And what I mean by that is if T is a monomorphism, remember I talked, you can think of the pullback like pulling back T along S. I'm sort of imitating. It like pulls back T along S. That's what P is. It's a pullback of T along S. And so if T is monomorphic, P is monomorphic. It preserves it as you pull it back along S. You see that as a really nice interpretation. Or over here on the right, as we pull back the monomorphism S, we pull back to Q. Q is monomorphic. Also a sub subset. So that's a really amazing. Like if A is kind of a subobject of C, it implies the pullback, V, the apex of the pullback is a sub object of P. And we're gonna see this with sets. Beautiful. Um, so they preserve monomorphisms here. And partly because of that, we can say um that uh oh I uh, uh, okay uh, no 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 I think that's right uh, I think that's right yeah um yeah um so we pull back T along S and we can think of this, this monomorphism from B to B here as being like S to the minus one of, of, of T. Like it takes T and it, and it kind of passes it back through S to get out a new monomorphism. Okay. That's the idea that that, that we can we could characterize it. And in fact, we can characterize this as S to the minus one. Um and uh and so here we we're sort of um, interpreting uh, this this square in terms of how S operates on it, and, and saying, well, it preserves monomorphism, so we'll term this uh, S to minus one of, of T, and, and this one S to minus one of A. I want to show how this works in set, okay? Um, uh, and maybe maybe I'll leave this. So in set. The pullback is the limit of this diagram where A, B, and C are what? In set, objects are what? Right. And what are morphisms in, in set? Functions. Functions. Right. So in set, the pullback is the limit of this diagram. Do you recognize this diagram? Well, it's the same one we've been dealing with, right? It, I just, Eugenia Chang just capitalized the letters, I think, to try to communicate that they're set. Okay. Um, so, so this is what it looks like. And again, flipping up. But here, a a cross b fibered over c, sort of over c, um, is what we call is one name for the the pullback. Okay, um, and that's a very common name for the pullback. It's the fiber product of a and b fibered over c. Um, and it basically is capturing pairs of A and B, which have what property? So like P is the projection down to B, right? It tracks the B part of the pair. A is the projection down to A, and it tracks the A part of each pair. And what's this fibered over C thing from? It reflects the what? We only pair up things who do what? Sorry? Uh, okay, yeah, and what must be a pattern of both A and B? So any pair from A and B, in order to be listed in this fibered product, they have to what? But uh, the, the, the A, it has to map to what? The same place in C. Same place in C as does the B. So it's only that compatible <laughs> compatible ones of A and B, ones that are treated as mapping to the same C. Does that make sense? They have to map down to the same C, the sort of classification of the same C. I want to think through for, for ease. We can think, I showed this in general, and this is true in general, but um, 
But for set, let's suppose that C were one. What is what is the so imagine this for a moment that C is is one. What when I say one in set, what am I talking about? Singleton. That's the what in it's the singleton is the terminal element. It's the terminal element. Um or the terminal object, I should say. Terminal object, right? Um if this is a terminal object, I'd say that saying that the first element of A, so if we consider each pair in A cross B or pi root by C, I'd say it's kind of you know trivial. It's it's kind of doesn't add any information to say that A and B have to map to the same C. Why is that? That's terminal. If C were if C were the 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 terminal object, the singleton, why do I say it doesn't add any information to do the primary? There's, there's no choice. Like, like what is B gonna map it to via S? Hmm. Um it is only one choice, map it to one, right? Um every one of B maps to one, and every one of A maps to one. So any of them are compatible. Any of them can be paired up, right? Does that make sense? Now, C were two elements, a thing of size two. Only some of the A's, some of the A's map to zero, maybe. Um, others map to one. Some of the B's would map to zero and others to one. And only A's that map to zero will go with B's that map to zero. And only A's that map to one will go with B's to map to one. Hmm? But if if it's a terminal object down there, what is this reduced to? If, if it's a terminal object, if we just have a singleton, what what is a cross b? What a cross b fiber over c? It's just the just the product. Yeah, it's just it's just the product. That's all it is with with terminal object down. There. It's just the product. Pullbacks are like a close. They're like like a product that has extra flexibility and has extra versatility. And so if all you have is the terminal object, there's no choice to what to map it to. You have the product. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Um, now, uh, we said that, you know, any, so if you stay in set, hmm, here we are, we have these pairs of A and B that both, uh, both, both elements of the pair map to the same C. Okay, great. Any other contender for the pullback, any other object that has this ability to extract an A, ability to extract a, a, a B, um, such as this square commutes that, that it, it, it goes around uh, and commutes. So T after G is equal to S after D after S after F, I should, uh, F after S. Um, so G after T is equal to F after S. That has to be any anything, any pretender to be the pullback, any contender, any would be pullback that has that, that in order to be a would be pullback, that has to have that basic property of commuting that F after S is equal to G after T. And if you have one of those, well, if it has an essential prop, just you know, just stuck onto it beyond the essence, beyond the best, beyond the, the distillation of of this fiber product, then it goes through the fiber product. We can express it in terms of the fiber product, just like we can express a, a, a non-prime number, a composite number in terms of right? It goes through. Um, uh, and and so it should this should be somewhat familiar from the from last time, where we had a similar notion with just a, a different diagram. Okay, so I want to build in set. I want to just remind you of some really common ones. And of course, most of these are from Eugenia, um, Eugenia Chun. Uh, so she has colors, pants, and shirt. So this is a diagram, right? So there's some mapping from pants to colors. What do you think that mapping does? For a given pant, it gives you what? Color of the pant. Uh, um, 
And for a given shirt, that mapping down on the right hand side gives you the what? Okay, so what's the pullback of this diagram? So these are sets, it's a bunch of pairs, a bunch of shirts, there's a bunch of colors. What's the what's the pullback of this diagram? Same, yeah, pairs of remember, remember pullback is, is gonna be a pair. So, so, yeah, so so one of these is a my diagram's surface, right? Let, let's call and not to you know, um, the master uh, rather than the apprentice, uh, we'll call shirts A and pants B. Oh, sorry. What, what did I, what did I, yeah. So shirt, uh, pants A and shirts B. Okay. That's, that's her, the masters. Sorry. That's right. So it's, a, or, or more to sharpen that, a pair of pants was the first one because this is A and shirts. Um, such that what is the case? Such that you you said it earlier. So pair, uh, so pairs. Each pair has a pant and a has, has a pair of pants. I guess we'd say right. Um, and and a shirt. Um, uh, of the same color. Why do we know that they have to have the same color? Yeah, they when they. Map down the uh, so remember T after Q has to equal S after P, right? And so when we consider the oh, <laughs> ah, okay, when we consider pants, um, a given set of pants, um, and we take its color, it has to equal the shirt of the pair and taking its color. Does that make sense? So this is this pairs of pants and shirts of the same color. Does that make sense? I think it's like so natural a concept. We almost use it without thinking about it, but this gives it a name. And sometimes said that category theorists uh, are different from a lot of other mathematicians. Because if you, if you show a mathematician um, some concept, some, some particular thing, maybe it's the disjoint union or something, uh, they'll say, show me an example of that. And a category theorist, if you show it to them, they'll say, say what is this an example of? Um, you know, like maybe it's an example, maybe a, a disjoint unit is an example of a co-product, which applies in all these, you know, all these different categories. Oh, it's different context. It's the same basic concept. We saw that with product last time, remember? Remember minimum or, or uh, you know, uh, the the greatest common uh, divisor or the you know um, the and it, it's the same concept it's the same concept again and again and again it's the same structure same structure same hidden concept and I'd say here we have a hidden concept we've been applying probably for all our life and we learn now it's it's the pullback and you'll see it appears in many contexts many guises many faces and Eugenia Chang is letting us see those faces um. Okay, now I'm going to be covering some cases where we have monos, where we have, and again, what is what's a good interpretation if A has a monic morphism to C? What's a good interpretation that A is a what? Is A injection in set? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, in set, yes. Yeah. And, and and it's it's an inclusion we might say or an injection. I generally, say inclusion in it. In other words. A is a subset of B of C. Hmm? A is remember this this diagram. It's, it's this is mapping that's that's uh, injective, right? And so it it's it's an inclusion. It includes this within this. Does that make sense? It identifies sort of um, a, a subset of this, right? Um, so so T is kind of. Identifying A as, as a subset of C, you could say. And the pullback of that is going to say that what? A cross C, a fiber by C is what? A subset of B. Let's go see this. And this is, this is one of the greatest things. And I, I got to give Richard Southwell, I, I just sort of aped his, his diagram and, and spiffed it up a little bit and taken it from to to technical art, but uh, 
you have the basic way of illustrating it. So, so, so let's go through how this is, is mapping. And, and I put it down there in the lower right, okay? Okay, so remember this idea of A is like a subset of C. That's what that morphism over on the right is saying. Do you, I wish I had like a long stick or something, but T, right? That's what T is saying, right? Yeah, some other, I don't know, some Open this now. anyway. Um, mm -hmm. that that one way over on the right hand side. I guess I can point with the mouse. This guy, this guy here. Do you see it? Do you see it? Okay. Um. So let's. Uh, and I, I, oh no. Oh no. Um. Is this being recorded? <laughs> I thought. I thought. Yes. I yes. This is recorded. Okay. 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 okay awesome. So, so that's saying A is a subset of C. So what I've shown on the right, and on the left and the right, is B and C, those outer things with the dashed lines, those are sets, okay? I'm, I'm not trying to show it purely in a categorical way. I'm saying, let's imagine what the sets are doing, just like I have in the, the board here. Mm -hmm. so, so each of these little circles is an element, okay? So we have set B over here on the left, and we have set C over here on the right. And these are, we're matching these as elements, I'm just developing an intuition for really what's going on here when A, B, and C are sets, and this is all on set. Okay, so we have set B on the left, and we have all these elements of it, and set C on the right, all these elements. Mm -hmm. And what that A monomorphism to T is saying is, so, so is there, there's a monomorphism from A to, A to C. And what's a monomorphism in set? It's a what? It's a what function. And Begins with I, injective, injective function, right? So it's saying that A is a subset of B. Same idea here. It's it's like a subset of B. It's within B. It maps to it in a way that doesn't lead to to composite. So we can sort of identify, or you might say, a purist might say. I don't know that it's it's A, but it's T that's identifying the subset of C, right? Just like the mapping is identifying the subset of T. Do you see that? The subset of, of C. No. But the T is identifying the subset of C. Okay. And you could quibble whether it's A or or what, but um uh you could say that each of these A's, you know, it, it articulates a subset of C. So that's what's shown here. That's kind of the subset of C delineated by A through T. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So here we go. So we have C on the right, and we have this the subset of it is as um is what we capture by A. Yeah? Um and so there's some of the elements of C that are within that subset, right? Those are the things in the dotted lines, in the red dotted lines, and then there's some things outside, right? And what is the pullback doing? We're pulling back T over S. Where is F here? Well, S is the mapping from B to C, right? Just look down there in the diagram, right? F is what maps B to C. And again, you know, I apologize to the master because I departed from her conventions because A and B have swapped. But anyway, it, let's go with my conventions here for a moment and curious that they are. So, B maps the C with S. See that? Mm. And so that's what I've drawn here. S maps every element of B. Mm. That's what a function does. It maps every element in the source to the target, right? So I've, I've drawn that, but I've drawn it in two colors because I want to distinguish um, the things that are within this inner set within B, the set within B whose image is what? So what this is doing is, so that subset of B, that subset of B that maps over to, to A, so that subset of, of C formed by, by A through T, that subset of B, subset of B is, is what? It's things in the pullback. 
a, a, a cross B fibered by C. Those are the things that, that are, are mapping um, to this to the subset. So what this is saying is that, that if you have a subset of C, if you have C and it's mapped to by S, mm, and A is a subset of C, mm, then S induces, it, it defines a subset of B. And that subset is defined by A cross B um, uh, fibered over, over, over C. Those, those are the elements of B that will be paired up with, with elements uh, over here uh, on the, the right-hand side in, in A. So each element of B is paired up with an element of A. Do you see that? Mm. And this is this is defining what the categorical sorry that the pullback is. It's sort of these pairs of elements that are mapped to by S in the same way. But the beautiful thing here is the monomorphism formed by T. The fact that A is a subset of B gives us a subset gives us a pullback that is a subset of B. So I think it's really cool. And it's sensible, right? It's like, yeah, you have a subset of C. If that's what A is, then you get in return a subset of B defined that maps there via S. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and of course, you can flip it, right? Like if if you instead were dealing with um, uh, a monomorphism on the bottom, um, and forgive me, I'm just. If you're dealing with something like on the right here, where you have monomorphism at the bottom, and you pull it back along T, um, then now A is going to be, uh, you know, the C is a subset of B, and, and you're going to have A as a subset of B, and, and so on. Um, or sorry, it's a sub, yes, of D, of the pullback. So here, when you have monomorphisms along one side, namely from A to C, the pullback preserving them means if you had a subset over there, um, as defined by that non-morphism T, you get a sub, you get the pullback being a subset of the um, it being defined uh, by you know and associated with the subset of B, and of course the pairing of it, the mapping I think is going to give you exactly those pairs A and B that form. The 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 uh, public that, that's the pairing up of an A and B. So that's that's a kind of lens by which to understand this notion of monomorphisms. This is for set, and but you can carry some of those intuitions over. If we have A being a subobject of C, as delineated by 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 T, really it's like T forms the just a T A uh, going up from uh, going up from T going up from A forms this sort of subobject. I think we might say, um, or T defines the subobject. Then we get a subobject over here on the other side uh, associated with the uh, the, the pullback. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. It's a, it's a kind of different angle on it, but it, it gives a sense of subobject, right? Now this is another case, and and here once again we have this case where morphisms are monic. Can you see that the morphisms here are monic? So, so these are, are these sets? Are these sets? They are sets. What is n? N is the real numbers, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Hmm? Mm hmm? That's how we're defining it. What is multiples of two? Is that a set? Yeah, give me a few examples. Yeah, yeah, zero, two, four, six, eight. Good. Is that a subset of the naturals? Yeah, you bet it is. Yeah, yeah, right? Any 
zero, we could map it into the naturals to zero, for example, two into two, right? Four into four, yeah? There's an injective mapping, right? Mm -hmm. There's a monomorphism, right? Um, are multiples of five a subset of the naturals? Yeah, so it is a monomorphism into naturals. Are you comfortable with that? So both of these are monomorphic. And what does that tell us about the other two? What does it tell us about the projections? That those must be what? Monomorphic, because we pull back T along, along S, and we get P monomorphic. And we pull back S along Q, and we get Q monomorphic. Hmm? Are, are we okay with that? And, and does that make sense? Or So if we do this pullback, so we have multiples of two as, I can't remember Eugene and Chen's um, convention as, uh, as B, <laughs> um, multiples of, of two, and A is multiples of five, what is the pullback? It's what? Sorry? Multiples of 10. And what, why, why is that? Just let's walk through the intuition. Why, why is it multiples of, of 10? Okay, it's, I mean, it, it, you could say, well, it's pairs of multiples of two and multiples of five, and, and that would be true. But it's it's not just any old multiples of two paired with any multiple. If that were product, it'll be any multiple of two with any multiple of five, right? It, it doesn't match them up. It doesn't match them by color, like the pants and the shirts, right? It just product just has all possible multiples of two and all possible multiples of five, and you get all combinations, right? And what I'm saying is. Pullbacks are more discriminating than that. They're more, they're more choosy, picky. They're more connoisseurs than that. What is the pullback going to require? It's it's get, that that pullback of multiples of two, multiples of five is going to only take pairs of a multiple of two and a multiple of five that are what? That are mm, yeah. Yeah, but map to the same value of n. Okay, so so would zero? Um, like if, if we considered, would zero be in multiples of two? Would it be in multiples of five? Um, would it be one of the things that if we if we considered the pairs? It's a pair of multiple of five and multiple of two. That have to map it to the same n. Would zero be in there? So it would be a pair of what? What would the first element be? Zero. The second element would be zero. But it'll be a. Would one be in there? No, because it's not not even either. Right? Would two be in there? Would 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 any would two be in there? Would it, would it be in multiples of two? Would it be in multiples of five? No. <laughs> and, and, you know, you could say, well, we could pair it up with five. We could pair it up with zero. We could pair it up with, with you know, 10. But they have to map to the same end. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't map. If, if, if you had two, it would map to two. We're there with T. Mm -hmm. And nothing over here maps to T, right? Or to, to, to two, nothing on the left. So, so two would not be part of this. Would, would five be part of this? For the same reason, right? There, there's multiples of five has five and it maps to, what does five map to along the bottom? It maps to five. What is, does five map to anything along the? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. So I mean, there's no five up there, and you can't pair it with anything else because they don't all map to the same natural number, right? So would ten be in here? Let's go through the reasoning. Why would ten be in there? Sorry. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. Okay. So, so, so help, help walk me through it, Tony. Mm -hmm. So, uh, ten is multiple of five. Yeah. And ten is also multiple of two. So it's going to be mapped to the ten times square. Uh, that's the mapping. Good. So, so it's is it in multiples of five? And what will F map it to? Uh, ten. Ten here. Is it in multiples of two? And what will that map it to? Ten. Okay, so it's in there. So multiples of 10 are the pullback of multiples of two and five. Which is kind of wild, right? It's 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 really useful, actually. It's a it's a very useful concept. It's in both of these with the number being equal, right? Um all the numbers that are in multiples of 10 are like, what's the form of this? Give me, give me the first, the first four of them. Okay, yeah, but zero, 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 zero. Yeah, 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 zero, zero. Yeah, I mean, it's 10, 20, but what I was looking for also is, it's actually pairs, right? Like, because it's pair, remember, it's, it's, it's like a, a more versatile product, right? A more, constrained a more well behaved product it, it's more picky it's more it's more of a connoisseur and and it has more structure to it and so it's zero zero ten uh, 10 10 20 20 30 30 right because it's pairs it's pairs of a multiples of five and a multiple of two that map to the same thing so they're always going to be the same because they have to be because they have to map to the same thing does that make sense okay um, this is from Richard Southwell. This is with Olox ontology. Mm. Mm. So he writes an amount of fuel down on the lower right. That's our, what is that? That's our what? What's our letter? The one on the lower right is for C. C. And he writes, and, and this is the language of Ologs, which David Spivak has written some wonderful stuff about. Um, so we have, it's related to ontologies, computational ontologies semantic, that are using the semantic web and other areas, medical, um, natural medical lexicographic system, et cetera. Um, so a car has an, an amount of fuel. An amount of diesel is an amount of fuel. And so if we take the pullback, we get a car, that's the first element, paired with an amount of diesel, that's the amount of fuel the car has. So it's like a pairing of cars and the amounts of fuel. Which is kind of cool, kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now this is Eugenia Chang's favorite pullback. Let's, let's unpack this. Is B a subset of A union B? Is that a subset B within A union B? Mm -hmm. Is A a subset of A union B? So it makes sense these are monomorphisms, right? Because in set, monomorphisms correspond to what sort of functions? Begins with I. In general, yeah. Good. Now, is P the projection down from A intersection B? Um, is that a defining a, a subset of B? Yeah, it's the subset of B that's also in what? A. Is, is this mapping from A intersection B to A uh, monomorphism? Because it defines, so it's it is extracting its projection to A from these things on the left, which are the subset of A's that are also in what? B. Yeah. And so this is a pullback square. And down in the lower right is C. Now that may freak you out a little bit because earlier we were thinking of like C. For, for examples where like C was colors, right? Or or C was 
was um, uh, an amount of fuel, but uh, here also it's natural numbers. So it could be a very large set. Here it's A union B. Mm. And we'll see why this is when we discuss push-ups. Because it turns out this is also a push-up effect. Um, it's a push-up, the other one. But, but here, A union B is C, right? And A is within C. B is within C, right? Um, and you have these two things in the opposite side, A and B, and their intersection uh, if, if P and Q, just sort of mapping there, that, that can be, if you have A union P down there, this turns up in the upper bound, which is rather pleasing, as she knows, isn't it? Is it not, as she said, right? Okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I think I'll, 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 I'll skip, skip this. Okay. Okay, so I have to undertake some exercises with pullbacks, right? Um, and uh, I I decided I would illustrate this um, in a certain way, but I'm grateful to Eric for having helped debug some problem. And so um, one of the, the realizations that the certain brought home for me, but hopefully I'll communicate it to you as well, is that pullbacks um, are generalization of set, I'm sorry, of, of products. Mm -hmm. They're like products with that allow for connoisseurs, only picking elements that are, they're connoisseurs of, of, of products. They, they, they only allow elements that are matched. Are we okay with that idea? Okay. Um, but here's the thing. They can't express any subset of the product. So in general, pullback, will provide pairs that are a subset of the product. Do you agree with that? Hmm? I could have drawn that out, actually. But um, uh, in fact, maybe I, I will draw that, right? Um, if we have if we have C here, and with deference to the last here, I'll put A down here, the part of my can find screwed up conventions here. And, and here we go. Um, and we're going to have, what do we have up here? This is the pullback square. We have what? A cross B and what? Fiber over C. Right? So only pairs that, that map to the same scene. Are we okay with this? And this is, I kind of like to call it pop A, but uh, projection down to A is projection down to B. You can skip A, I don't know if you'd like to use Q. Um, um, but here we could define here a cross B. What is this? What is a cross B? And it also has. Has a mm, um, mm, uh, that's right. Uh, this is a monomorphism. Um, it's a unique monomorphism. Whatever. Um, it's a unique monomorphism. Um, uh, that that goes and actually it and 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 um. I'm sorry, it actually doesn't, it, it, it actually doesn't make this commute, does it? It actually makes, um, it doesn't make this final commute, because then, then it would be, then it would be like the, the better one, yeah, for me to this commute. But what it makes this commute is, is actually this and what's here, terminal object, right? And the point is that the, the pullback is a subset of the product. Every pair in the pullback, fiber number C, every pair is within the product. The product is all the pairs, not discriminating at all, just kind of all of them. Whereas 
the pullback is more kind of certain it only has compatible hubs, right? Um, and and what I'm saying here is that this isn't an arbitrary subset. We can't always get an arbitrary subset of the product in the pullback. In other words, there may be subsets of the product that we can't express with the pull. And, and this was brought out nicely uh, by some of Eric's comments and, and just talking about it. So I'm going to show you an example of an infeasible relation to capture. Okay, so, so here we have, these are permanent resident citizenship, born in Canada, born outside. And, you know, I have more refined terminology, born, you know, in Canada or to a Canadian parent citizen or whatever, but, but we'll bear with this for the moment. So a product of these, so I, I put a check mark if um, it's going to be part of the uh, of the uh, pullback we want, or part of the relation we want to capture. So what would a product give you? A product between these things and these things. Um, I'll just tell you. I mean, it will give you a check mark in all of this. You'd have all possible combinations, right? And and um, we give all possible combinations, born in Canada with visa, born in Canada, permanent resident, born in Canada, citizenship, born outside of Canada, visa, born outside of Canada, permanent resident, born outside of Canada, citizenship, right? Mm -hmm. That's what a product would be. Very blunt. It's kind of the canonical one that just projects down to these things with no further, you know, no further discernment about about how they do. Now, what I'm trying to say is that um, the pullback is more picky. It's more discerning. It's more of a connoisseur. And it's going to require things mapped to the same C. Are we okay with that? Mapped to the same C? Mm hmm? Okay. And one thing I, I did is I used to illustrate this in general and the solution to the, the exercise, I, I colored things, I used different colors to indicate different values of C, okay? So the idea would be, maybe we'll have two values of C, one for people born outside of Canada and one for people born in Canada, something like that. Um, and those will allow different subsets of this thing. That was the idea, okay? Now, but there's a there's a problem. It it goes it goes pretty merrily along um, for some. Right, we could say okay, magenta. Um, well, so so here, remember we have what we'll call this um, without lots of generality. We'll call this a. So I I, I stand. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna. Just make this clear. I'm going to call this whole area A. These are the values of A. Remember, we're taking the pullback of, of two things. So this is A down here. Okay, we can, can we merge these? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Um, and up here, I'm going to insert a row above, and we will merge these, and we're going to call these what? Anyone? I'm going to call them B. It's going to be our B. Okay. Um, so these are the the, the things we want to of which we want to take the, the products here. Okay. Um, and these can be in black. Right. There we go. Um, these can be in black here. Okay. Um, so we have A and B here. A uh, A is visa permanent resident citizenship. That that set. And B is the set here at associated with the columns, born in Canada, born outside of Canada. So a product of them would have a check mark on all of these, right? You'd have all possible combinations. A pullback in them would pair up only compatible values of A and B. Compatible according to the map to the same one, value of C. And I'm indicating the value of C to which they map without giving it a number, I've just indicated with color. So what I'm saying is for B, things in this color, born in Canada, will map to the magenta, see? 
And this row, citizenship, will map to Magenta C. Hmm? It's kind of a scheme, right? And, and uh, this call, born outside of Canada, will map to the blue C. And these two calls, visa and permanent resident, will map to the blue. Hmm? And, you know, the thing for which I was uh, jonesing at, I was aiming at, was that, that here, you know, born outside of Canada, there, you know, visa and permanent resident apply, whereas for born in Canada, only citizenship applies if they were born in Canada. So that's kind of what I was jonesing at. And, it, you know, it starts, it starts quite well. Okay, born in Canada, citizenship. The only one in this column that has a check mark is, is, is this um, cell down here, uh, this, this one in the lower right. Why is that? Why is that the only one? Why, why is it for visa, for example? Point, yeah, yeah, but in terms of mapping to C, what, why is that there's none, there's no check mark here? Why is it not part of the check mark indicate if it's part of the, if that pair of, of column and row is part of the pullback? Why isn't Visa and Board in Canada part of the pullback? Part of the pullback? Because they, yeah, different values for C as indicated by the color, by the color. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I had that in the exercise I said, or to Canadian parents. So I'm just leaving this out. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. No question. Certainly correct. But I, I left it out of this. Okay. okay. Um, just so this wouldn't be, you know, horribly long. Anyway, um, so that, that works well. But now we have born outside of Canada. Okay, that's going to be the blue ones. And we're going to have it for any row and column combination, A and B pair, that has the same color, blue. We're going to have in our, remember, check mark means it's in our pullback, right? So is Visa and born outside Canada in our pullback? Yeah, why is it in the pullback? Because both of them are what? Same color. Yeah, they're, they're mapped to the same scene. Is permanent resident and born outside of Canada in the pullback? Same color. But is citizenship and born outside Canada? No. And so this is, now we're, now we're in a quandary because what we want to say is like people born outside of Canada can become citizens. But there are other options only available that that to which that only apply for them, whereas born in Canada automatically is citizenship. But with the pullback, we can't, we don't have the flexibility to express that. We don't have a way to, to have that subset where we can have a check mark here in this lower right. There's no value of C, which you know we assign to this column that will let us. Let us design. If we make it magenta, then we can't get the first two. We make it, and and so what I what I um, sought to do here was to uh, as for each of these to define a, uh, a a refinement. So here we go. So now we have um, four categories: visa, permanent resident, naturalized citizen, native-born citizen. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that. Uh, okay, so now I went a whole hog, right? Oh, now I went, I went the full meal deal. Okay, born in Canada or the Canadian parents. So there you go, there you go, right? Uh, no, no, okay. So, so um, why is there a check mark in this one down here? Because, yeah. So we can A and B, right? And A and B that map to the same color, right? A, 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 a row and a. Hmm? To pair a native born citizen and born in Canada to Canadian born parents, which has the same color, the same mapping, same mapping of C, same value of C. So, do we agree this is, can be in the pullback? Does it map the same value of C? It's compatible, it's, it's you know, it's discerning and, and picky, and it says that next, the, that matches the picky, picky nose test, right? Um, this is not good. Um, the, the picky test that that uh, that can be in our pullback because they map to the same color. 
Um, and then for this other column, we can have these are permanent residents and naturalized citizens. Do you see that? And we can express this, right? Here. Um, so what I'm saying, what I'm trying to communicate here is that pullbacks are more flexible than products. What would the product of these be? Again, what's the product? All of them check marks, right? There's no ability to be discriminating at all, right? No value to be, no ability to be discerning in which is paired with which. Here, we can be discerning and we can be picky, but we have to craft our sets to be able to express it. We can't express an arbitrary subset of this, right? With a pullback. Pullbacks are good. They're very crafty and allow you to carve out different subsets, but it can't carve out all subsets. Mm -hmm. It can carve out certain. And this is compatible in a way that this is not. Do you see what I did? And in order to do that, of course, I, I could tweak the citizen categories, make one that applies, which it does in life, naturalized, apply to those born outside Canada and not to Canadian parents, whereas native born, you can get that if you're born, uh, uh, you know, you, you can get that if you're born in Canada, Canadian parents, but you wouldn't get a naturalized citizen, which is what you get after the fact, right? Are we okay with this? Okay, so let's go to example two. Okay, okay, okay. So here we have age groups. Mm -hmm. and, and we have employment patterns. I call that ineligible. Um, I think I and maybe I used a different term in the thing, but I, I thought ineligible. Like they're not eligible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want to express again. What would a what would a uh, product be for this? Any anyone? Sorry. Yeah, and so yeah, all the options, everything will be checked. Right? Very non-discerning. Um, not at all careful of what's paired with what. It's it's canonical. It, it, it captures all possibilities and there's a role for that, but but sometimes we want more than that. We want a finer grained stuff. We want a finer grained tool, right? So so let's try the pullback here. Can we express this with a pullback? Well what what we want to say is that 0 to 15 year olds are ineligible and 16 and older, 16, 17, 18 plus uh, can't work. None of them are ineligible. And can we express this with pullback? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Right? And you can see how. So we we have two values of C, right? One is magenta, and we and remember, we're going to be pairing up values of A, that's the columns. Oh, sorry, that's the rows, with values of B, that's the columns, right? But we're only going to pair up values of, of, of A and B that are what? That map to the same value of C, which is the same color, indicated with color. So we're going to map up ineligible for, to, with which one? Zero to 15, because that's also in magenta. Both of them are magenta, so we get a check. Right? That is in our pullback. Hmm? It, it's got that one because they're compatible, right? And then why are there check marks in all these ones involving like full-time, part-time, unemployed for these two columns to the right? Why are there check marks there? Yeah, they, they, they are, so value of A, say employed full-time, and a value of, of B, say 18 plus, they map to the same value of C as indicated by the color. So they're in our pullback, right? Of course they're in the product, but but pullback is more picky. And it's gonna only include it if they're mapped to the same value of C, which they which they are because they call it, right? Why is that ineligible? Um, why is that not checked for 16 and 17 and 18? Because it their value of C, yeah, from the call. Do you, do you start to get a sense of like Okay, pullback is really flexible, but there's some constraints. I mean, it can do a lot better than product, but it can't do anything. It can't, it can't express an arbitrary subset, right? Okay, now problem three. Okay, diabetes with complications, diabetes without complications, pre-diabetes, normal glycemic. That's 
normal blood sugar levels. Okay, um, these are different stages of, of risk associated with diabetes. Um, complications might include retinopathy and nephropathy and, and uh, neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, and heart disease. These problems with the eyes, kidneys, um, uh, feet, etc., um, or, or uh, nerve damage in the extremities. Um, it come from prolonged diabetes. And so, so we have these categories of disease, that's our A, and then we have categories uh, up here of, of sort of diagnosis or knowledge. So one is it's not applicable, another is undiagnosed, another is diagnosed but not treated yet, another is diagnosed treated. Mm -hmm. You can imagine stratifying model models, right? And a stock and flow model, for example, where we have age categories and and for each success one and each, and we stratify by both of these. And okay, but we don't want any combination. Why, why not any combination? Yeah. Why not undiagnosed with normal glycemia? Why is that a blank? There's nothing to diagnose. So it doesn't make sense, right? Okay. So 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 can this be described with a pullback? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so normal glycemic, we make that go with diagnosis not applicable because we give them the same value of C. So they can be picked up. Whereas these early columns, uh, sorry, these earlier rows, pre-diabetes, diabetes with complication, diabetes uh, without complication, are in the same value of C as these columns, undiagnosed, diagnosed, untreated, di uh, diagnosed, treated. And, and therefore they're compatible and they can be part of the poll. Do you see that? And therefore, we have checked, and that's in our pullback. So, again, what would what would the what would the product be here? It would be what everything checked, totally indiscriminate, right? Totally just just kind of canonical to everything. Again, I, I have a weak spot in my heart for product. I mean, it's it's great, but this allows a much finer grained characterization, but it's not infinitely fine. It's not infinitely flexible, right? But it's pretty powerful, pretty powerful. And guess what? Um, within algebraic stock flow, within stock flow.jl out of our lab, this is exact value stratification. And you have, you recognize this square? What is this square? As indicated by this, it's a what square? Pullback square, it's a pullback square. And, and we'll talk about what these are, but basically you have, Different strata for this be age, maybe uh, a sex, maybe another strata would be employment status, another strata would be um, where you were born, you know, inside outside Canada or, or two Canadian parent parents, and uh, and and so you have strata, and then then it turns out you have some underlying core structure to the model, and you can layer in successive strata. You can do pullbacks in succession. And you get out of stratified model. But the beauty of it is it's modular. Because when we stratify models normally, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, it becomes so overwhelming. It's hard to visually see the logic and so on. And this allows you to layer in strata in a very modular way, one by one, and, and, and or take them out and, and very flexibly without it encrusting the whole model, having to go tailor it all and, and make it a real pain to pull it out. You can you can just layer them in really nice. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all pullbacks. And you can capture these non-uniform structures. It's not just products. Products would be like all combinations of age with all combinations of employment status, right? But we know that we don't want that, right? We want to be able to be more picky, more discriminating, more, more um, particular about the pairs. We don't want to just always do all age groups with all employment categories or all age groups with all, you know, um, uh, education levels or something like that. So we use pullbacks. That's why we use pullbacks. Pullbacks are the workhorse, ladies and gentlemen, associated with stratification. They're also the workhorse associated with some other components under the, uh, under the, um, um, under the covers. Um, maybe I'll just say, I, I don't have much on pullbacks, so maybe I'll just quickly go through some 
some comments on that, the cost of underplaying them, because I do want to move on to algebraic data types. Next time, cool. And, and exponential objects, which are also incredibly cool. So, so duals, every categorical construction, universal construction has a dual. And, and limits have co-limits. And give me, do you remember the three limits I gave you? What were the three limits? Okay. Terminal, product, all that. And for co-limits, it's just co, it means backwards, right? Initial objects, co-products, push ads. And you can, you can start to anticipate the properties right away. Um, I don't even have them all described. I, I, I ran out of time, but but you remember um, uh, if we, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to one of them, um, which would be, be rather nice. Um, so push outs um, are a di are a um, co-limit over a diagram like this. And, and this diagram, what's the difference? You know, casually they look the same, A, B, and C, C in the middle. What what's what's the difference here between what we see on the left, which is for push outs, and what we see on the right for pullbacks? What's what's the difference? There's a big difference, even though C looks in the middle and A B is there. What's the big difference? Okay, yeah, so we're gonna have co-limits and limits, but there's something else that's different about these diagrams, something key to the direction of the arrow. On the right, they're going into C, and the left, they're going out of C. All right, yeah, that's a pretty big difference, because remember category theory, it's all about the relationship. It's all about the relationships, and it matters whether, you know, um, um, you know, uh, this other person is my mother or I'm her mother, right? Um, that, that's pretty important, right? Um, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so we have a diagram over which we're going to take the co-limit hmm? and we take the co-limit. Now, you can be excused for saying, well, wait a minute, it's the same diagram. The arrow is going up to the, to the right and down to the but by the way, this one I correctly got the Virginia Chang's convention, um, but I erred in, in the other, um, in imitating the master, but here A is down in the lower left, right? Mm, mm. I think that's according to hers. So what's the difference between this and that other diagram we have for pullbacks? First of all, where's where's the push up? Where in the diagram? Lower right. Where was it in the pullback? Upper left, right? Right? Okay. Um, now C is in the upper left. Remember that? Okay, now, do you remember moreover, when C was in the lower right before, the pullbacks, the arrows from B, how did they relate to C? What direction did they end? It went from where? B to C. And now it's from C to B. It's 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 C to B. Yeah, so um we're gonna see the implications. Where are the projections? Or sorry, where are the analogs to the projections, the reverse projections? The thing used to be the projection, but now it's the reverse. Now it's the injection. Now it's the or insertion. Where where are they in this diagram? Where did they for pullbacks? Where were those? Where were the projections? Do you remember? Um they were here, right? Phi A, Phi P, just on the left and, and, and the upper side. Where are they here? The opposite to them are P and Q. And those are insertions. Those are things which stick things in to the push up. You get, get like A. It's e either, you know, the the, the provinces of Canada, one of the provinces, Saskatchewan, or, you know, British Columbia, or Ontario, or it's a province and territory. It's, you know, um, uh, Nunavut, or uh, Northwest Territories, the Yukon Territory. You, and, and you, you know, from the 
provinces, you stick it into the province side from the territories, you stick it into the to the territory side of, of the, the co-product. Remember, the co-product is like you got either this or that, not not both. It's either, uh, you know, um, okay. Um, or it could be a co-product of provinces, and then um, then you stick it into one of them. So the universal property here is you know, any other contender, right? Um, so so here we have our, our cup product and any other contender is has got extra cropped, extra stuff on top of the, the cup product. This is the cup product, that's the minimalist, that's the best, that's the, the most essential one, the distillation of, of having this, either this or that. And anything else that's a pretender to the throne, anything else that's a would-be cup product. It has extra stuff attached to it. So it's factorized by this. Do you get that? That's fact uniquely factorized in a way that makes this communal. Okay. In a way that makes it communal. I think you're familiar with it, so I'm not going to dwell on it. And we indicate it with this little diagram here, with this little thing, which um is is emphasizing it down there in the lower right. So there we there we go. Okay. Um, and fortunately it seems that I I correctly um in a uh, um, convention. So this is the push out, okay? Um, and we often will write it this way. Instead of time, it's 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 plus. It's either this or or that. Remember, do you remember how we denoted co-products? It was as a plus. Yeah, it's a plus. Um uh okay. Now it turns out. Just as in Stockholm at JL, pullbacks form a key part of the infrastructure. So do pushouts. And I'm not going to go to all the details here. Cheyenne can talk with you more about it, show you how to do it when you compose, but they come in in a central way when composing diagrams. So if you have a diagram X and another diagram Y, normally the set of, let's say, stocks. Just to, to simplify it. Um, it's either from X or from Y, right? So S here is an X, right? I here is an X, R here is an X. But over in Y, you have a V, and then we have an X, and that's the S in Y. If it were a simple co-product, we would have X's S and Y's S. Those would be two different S's, right? Remember co-products, you say either we have this or we have that, and it's a disjoint union. It's a tagged union. You don't get confused that it's the same S. You, you say, no, it's X's S or Y's S. Now, push-outs are, are like that, except that you can do what? What's, what's the extra thing we can do with push-outs? Remember from the book? Or maybe watching on, on one of the videos? What's the extra thing we can do? We can limit the, the items that are in the, the yeah. The but it's actually we identify them. We put them in the same equivalence class. So pullbacks we limited, pushouts we put things in the same equivalence class, such that when we go around the diagram one way. It goes around the diagram the other way. If they went to different ways, oh no, they went to as Eugene Yucheng said, oh no, they they went to different places. The the, the same C could be mapped here. So what are, how do we deal with that? Well, if if the same C goes to two different places through P and Q and or a Q after T and P after S, um, we we treat them in the same equivalence class. Okay, so here we're going to take a push out. We're not going to just take a co product, which would be X's S and Y's S and X's I and Y's V and X's R. No, 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 for the stocks. No, no, no. What we're going to do is we're going to take the push out, which is going to allow us to unify them to say, oh, it's the same. And so we're going to unify X and S with, sorry, S and X. That S, we're going to unify it with S and Y and join them by that. It's like we have what would be two different diagrams, either or that one. And now we 
we unify them, say them the same. They're then the same equivalence class, they're the same thing. X is the same between them. And now they're glued together. Now you have one diagram that is S and B, and then this is the vaccination component. That's up there. And, and you have the other diagram from here, and they're joined together at X because we identified S. We said it's the same S. It's in the same part. It's, it's the same. And that's what we can do with push -ups. We can identify things. We can, we say it's either in this or that, or it's the same. It's, it's the same. It's, it's, it's relaxed. It's relaxed again from what we can do with, with, with co-products. We're forced into saying, no, nope, it's in this one or that one. But here we can say, no, it's, it's actually the same thing. Hmm? Does that make sense? Okay, so guess what? I, do you remember that the you know, the product? Do you remember with pullbacks? We had the special case. Do you remember up here where we had one, C being one? If we took, if, if C only had one possible value, remember that? It's only one possible value that X and G could get. Remember that with pullbacks? What did that yield the pullback be? It's the product. It reduced to the product because there's no there's no discernment going on. There was no pickiness. There's no connoisseur going on. It's just everything was in the same C. So everything is compatible with everything else. Remember that? For pullback. For pushouts, guess what? Services this project as this brought as this uh, same thing. It's Initial object. It's not the terminal object. That's what one is. It's the initial object. And the initial object, if you have the initial object here, then guess what? Guess what uh, T is? This is the initial object. Guess what S is? The one arrow. Like the single arrow of, of the initial object, right? The single thinking arrow out of the initial object uh, is there. It's, it's our view, right? Um, uh, is there, and and then P and Q can map up. You know, uh, aren't going to unify anything. They're not going to be. They're not going to unify anything. There's no particular um, thing picked out as as being in the same equivalence class. You get a. a plus. Do we see that? Um, which is is pretty clear. And and by the way, we we will often write and, and instead of plus, we'll sometimes write this this sort of square union, um, which is the same thing. And it turns out this Eugenia Chen's paper talk here 15 years ago and today remains this one, which is both a guess what? A pullback and yeah. Where's the pullback? Upper left, right? Remember, remember, like intersection is like. Remember, with intersection, it's like product of sets. Do you remember that? And that that diagram product. It's 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 um uh, this this uh, uh, one that 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 needs uh, both there to be in there. Um, uh, the the greater lower bound. Of, um, but then down here in the lower right, which one is that? That's that's the push out. That's the push out. It joins things together, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is incredibly cool in my mind. Um, and I want you to, sorry, um, I want you to um uh, I want to ask you. I told you before, pullbacks preserve monomorphisms. What would you immediately suspect that push outs do? No. They preserve what? Well, okay, but if a pullback preserves one, it honors monomorphism. Pullback a monomorphism, and you get a monomorphism. Remember that? Remember, remember that? Like way back, back here, we ended up using it here. Remember this? Um, remember uh, pullbacks always preserve. Hey, where is it? Here, monomorphisms. You pull back. Guess what? Pushouts preserve. Epimorphisms. Because they're just a flip. They're just a flip. So they preserve epimorphisms. It's awesome. It's awesome. Mm. 
Ladies and gentlemen, push outs and pullbacks are recommended by both beauty, utility, and power. And I know it's not been easy. I know it's not hard. And it makes your brain hurt sometimes. But if you can grow comfortable with this, and it takes time, it grows on you, takes mulling it over, thinking it through, um, trying it out, trying it on for size. But if you can get comfortable with this, you can do amazing things with it and will achieve amazing good by building the next generation of modeling tools using for health modeling using these techniques. Okay. So, so this is going to temporarily um, sort of complete our tour through some limits and some co-limits as universal constructions. Next time we're gonna talk about this really neat universal construction that I don't think is, is either one of them, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but I, I think it's the exponential, okay? Which represents And not all categories have co-products, not all pro categories have products, not all categories have push-outs, not all categories have pullbacks, but some of the most important ones, and certainly the most beautiful ones, have these, have these properties in all of these exponential objects, which represent their own morphisms within the category. They, they have these objects which represent morphisms in the category. Just like in Haskell, we have types that represent maps between types. Don't tell you it takes an int and returns a bool, or takes an int and a double and returns a bool, or whatever. Um, we have types that represent mappings of types. So it is, we'll have objects that represent morphisms in a category. And we'll be able to do core things with them, but those will open the gateway for this hugely important thing in computer science of algebraic data types which are all sorts of amazing properties you never knew could exist in a data type, but we'll just pour out of it based on your knowledge of co-products, products, terminal objects, initial objects, and soon, ladies and gentlemen, exponential objects. Are we ready? You keen? Okay, okay, so let's let's go uh, do that next time. So get started on chapter 20, if you could, but next time I'm gonna be giving you some videos um, to look on exponential objects. And uh, and then we'll also be, um, be be trying out some on, possibly I'll give you a video on, on algebraic data types, but possibly I'll just cover it. So I know it's not easy. I know it's hard. I imagine, I, I admire your stalwartness. Thanks very much. And we will see you next time. Thanks, Greg.